so continuing on in the book of Matthew, uh, we come into Matthew chapter 5 there, which of course is the beginning of um, Matthew 5, 6, 6 and 7 are all you know, continu uh, contiguous chapters. It's all one sermon that Jesus Christ preached. And, you know, I, I believe I'm correct in saying it's probably the greatest sermon that's ever been preached. You know, I, it's probably the greatest preacher that's ever lived. Amen. So, you know, I'm not going to be in a rush over these next few weeks to get through these chapters. You know, a lot of times we're going through the, a chapter uh, every Thursday. You know, we try to go through the whole chapter. But there's just so much in these chapters. I mean, just in Matthew chapter 5 alone. I mean, there's just so much to go over. There's so many great truths that can be developed from the things that Jesus said that I don't, I don't really feel the need to just get through it so we can check off Matthew chapter 5 and move on to Matthew chapter 6 and so on and so forth. So bear with me. Maybe, maybe it'll only go one or two weeks. Maybe it'll go three or four. I don't know how long it's going to go. Um, but I know we've got enough here tonight to, to think on. So let's get right into it. The Bible says there in verse 1, it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. So again, we're just going verse by verse and kind of making application where we can. And one of the first things we see here is that when Jesus was set up in the mountain, it was his disciples that came unto him. And I think that's something that we need to take note of, is the fact that his disciples came to him. That tells us one thing, that it's going to take effort and purpose if we're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's not something that's going to come automatically. It's not going to be something that happens on its own. I mean, he went up into a mountain and set himself. And then his disciples had to go up to him in a mountain. You know, and, and that's, that can be kind of a, a bit of a task. I don't know how, how huge that mountain was or how big it was. I mean, it's only got to be a thousand feet, I think, to be classified as a mountain. We think of, if you've if been in Phoenix, you could think of South Mountain or several of the mountains around here. That maybe he wasn't you know, sitting up on some snow-capped peak. But he was definitely up in a mountain where it was probably some people said, you know, it's not worth the time for me to have to go up there. But it does say there that his disciples came unto him. And what we can learn from this is the fact that people who get saved do not always become disciples. Not every person that prays at the door is going to become a disciple. <clears throat> go ahead and turn over to keep something in Matthew 5, of course, all night. But go ahead and turn over to Luke chapter 17. And this is important to notice because that's one of the, one of the, kind of one of the criticisms that people who go soul winning receive. They'll say, well, what about the follow-up? What about the discipleship? How, when are they going to get out to church? They get hung up on this, but they fail to realize that in Scripture, what we see is that not every person that receives Christ is somebody that's going to be necessarily someone that follows Christ. And that's kind of why I disagree sometimes. In fact, all the time when somebody, well, from time to time, you'll hear people describe salvation as, I'm a follower of Christ. They'll say, this person has become a follower of Christ. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Yeah. Yeah. Say, what they're trying to say is that person got saved. Well, there's a difference between getting saved and following Christ. Amen. You know, following Christ takes work. It takes effort. It takes determination. It takes character. It takes fortitude. It takes a lot of things to really follow closely to the Lord. Salvation doesn't require any of that. Salvation is easy. Salvation is simple. I mean, salvation is so easy that even a child can do it. Amen. I mean, it's so simple that, you know, it's just by belief. It's, only, it's a matter of just putting your faith in Jesus Christ. That is not difficult because that's how much God loves us that He made salvation that simple. Amen. Amen. So if you're there, uh, look at Matthew chapter... Well, you're going to Matthew, or excuse me, Luke 17. The Bible says in John 8, I'll read to you from John 8, it says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If ye continue in My word, then are ye My disciples indeed. See, there's a difference between being a child of God and being a disciple. You know, God, God says that to be His disciple, you have to forsake all and take up your cross daily. That's what Jesus said to people that want to follow Him. Are you, are you, you, know, you know, let the dead bury their dead. You know, take up your cross and follow Me. That's not, what, that's not salvation. That's a, that's a, there's a difference there between being a child of God and being one of His disciples or somebody that would follow Christ. You're there in Luke 17. Look at verse 11. It says, And it came to pass as He went to Jerusalem that He passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lift up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, and with a loud voice glorified God, and fell down at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give God glory, save the stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. 
Now, why did it Jesus? Now, so people that would criticize people that would go out and get people saved, right? Kind of like Jesus, this is a picture of salvation. That the you know the leprosy is if they're healed of their leprosy, they, they believe the word that Jesus said. He said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And when they turn to go do what he said, that they was gonna be they would be cleansed to go. That's the only time they would go see the priest, is to show themselves cleansed, that they could be, you know, uh, sh that the priest could proclaim them as being clean. So we see that they're acting in faith when they when they turn to go see the priest. That it was an act of faith on their behalf. So this is a picture of salvation. The, the leprosy is removed, just like when a person gets saved, the leprosy of sin. I mean, leprosy is a picture of sin. It's cleansed from them. We do that by faith. But only one person came back, right? And what about people that would, would, why, would they criticize Jesus here? Why didn't you follow up with those nine, Jesus? Why didn't you make sure they got, did you make sure they got to the priest? Did you make sure they went and offered the, the sacrifice according to Moses? Why didn't you get them to come follow you? You know, that would be the same criticism, wouldn't it? Right. But Jesus doesn't follow up on the nine, right? What he does is he asks, where are they? He says, well, where are the nine? And it's kind of ironic that that's the same question that, that the critics have. They say, you know, they I ironically ask, they say, where, where is everybody? You know, well, Jesus, when he got him saved, when he got him healed, he asked the same thing. That's what we're doing. I mean, I'm not against people, you know, uh, following up if that's what they want to do. But I'm not going to uh, you know, kill myself over it. I say, well, where are they? If they're not here, they're not here. Right. He says, uh, do you think that... Uh, <clears throat> I just wonder if these critics, if they, if they would question whether or not those nine really got cleansed. Well, they're not following Jesus. They're not in church. Mm -hmm. you know, do they really get cleansed? I mean, does the Word of God have power or not? I mean, if a person really gets saved at the door and they never darken the door of the church, if we go to their home and knock on their door and share the gospel with them and they never get saved... Are we going to sit back and say, well, do we know they really didn't get saved because they don't show up in church? I mean, would you say that to Jesus? Well, the, the nine, they didn't, follow, they didn't come and follow you. Did they really get cleansed? We wouldn't say that. <clears throat> and I love what Jesus says to the one guy that comes back. The one guy that comes back, who comes all the way to Jesus and worships, what's he say? Go thy way. <laughs> you know, that's, it'd be like, he, he's like, don't, even, don't, don't follow me. You know, but that's what these critics say. Well, you got to—they're not—they're not really saved unless they're following Jesus, unless they're coming to church, reading, and doing all these things. But Jesus says, "Go thy way." And was, I found that to be interesting. Go ahead and turn over to Mark chapter five. <clears throat> Mark chapter five. This is this is something that Jesus did often when he was telling people when people would get saved, when people would get healed by him. Mark chapter five, verse eighteen. Mark five eighteen. And when he was coming to the ship, he saw that had been. He that had been possessed with the devil prayed that he might be with him. So here's this guy that got, you know, the demoniac of Gadara who's saying, let me be with you. Let me follow you. Let me be your disciple. Let me go with you. Albeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, go home to thy friends. He said, don't follow me. And tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee. <clears throat> and had, and hath, had compassion on thee. <clears throat> you know, and people want to criticize the fact that maybe we don't do the follow-up like we should. But, you know, the world, it used to be when you'd go out soul winning, when it got took off in America, you know, back in the, in the, the heyday, well, the, you know, the time of Jack Hiles and John R. Rice and all these, these are, you know, the spiritual forefathers, those that went before us that kind of really made soul winning a thing in America, going door to door, and really brought it uh, to America for the first time. It used to be a different country. And it used to be that would be enough to bring people to church. Just going and hanging an invite to church. People would just come to church on their own. You wouldn't have to drag them to church. And here's the thing. Nobody had to drag me to church. And last I checked, you know, I didn't have to drag any of you to church tonight. I don't remember calling all of you up and saying, hey, you're going to make that. Make sure you're there. Are you going to come tonight? You know, I wasn't checking up on you. I leave it up to people whether or not they want to be in church. And I've done my fair share of dragging people out to church. I mean, I was in a church for 11 years, and seven of those years, I was a bus captain. And if anybody, anyone here in the room is familiar with what a bus captain is, that's where you're, you're running a bus route in a church, going out and picking up kids in the neighborhoods and bringing them to church on Sunday. Well, that doesn't just happen on Sunday. You don't just show up on the, at the door on Sunday and say, hey, we're here, we're here to pick you up. You have to go out on Saturday. Yeah. And you have to promote. And you have to talk to the kids. And you have to get them excited. You have to get them pumped up. You've got to make them want to come. And then when you, then you, have to, when you get up on Sunday, you've got to call and make sure they're getting up. And you have to run to the house and bang on the door. And, you know, it's, it's, it's literally dragging people to church. And what I found from all that, you know, there are a lot of great lessons that were learned. I don't regret it. But what I found most often is that when, when you quit dragging somebody to church, they quit coming to church. People tend, where if you have to carry somebody, wherever you put them down, that's where they stay. 
And they often go back to where they were, and then you have to try and pick them up again. So I, I, I'd rather just leave it in the hands of God to build this church. Go ahead and turn over to Matthew yeah. chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. The Bible says in Matthew 16, verse 18, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now who's going to build the church? Peter? <clears throat> no. Jesus said, I will build my church. Amen. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And that's what we see in Scripture. That's the example of we see in Scripture. In Acts 2 it says that they were praising God and having favor with the all people and the Lord added to the church daily such as, excuse me, should be saved. And in Luke, in Luke 14 we're told that we are to go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be full. Now whose house is it we're trying to fill up? God's house. Heaven. That's what that parable is talking about. It's talking about God's house in heaven. That's the house I'm concerned about filling. That's the place, that's who I that's where I want to get people to go. Is to heaven. That's my main focus. I want people out there, whether they ever come here to Faithful Word Tucson or any other church in the area, I want them to go to heaven. Amen. More than anything. And if we do that, and if we make that our focus, I believe God will bless and we will see people come to church on their own. I mean, look around tonight. There's 17 people in the room tonight. I didn't make one phone call, and I suspect none of you did either. Right? You all just decided, hey, I want to get out to church. Why? Because you want to go to where the preaching of the Word is. Because you're interested in actually following Jesus Christ. You know, salvation's great, but you want to go a step further and actually be in the house of God and hear the preaching of the Word of God. <clears throat> you know, I'd rather be guilty of not enough follow-up. I'd rather have them say, hey, you don't follow enough up on, on these people. You don't do enough follow-up. I'd rather be guilty of that than be guilty of not enough soul money. I'd rather, be, I'd rather say, hey, you're spending too much time knocking doors and giving the gospel than you are just going back to the same old doors trying to get people who don't really even want to go to church to come to church. <clears throat> and just leave it up to God. You see, a disciple, by its very definition, is a follower. It's a devotee. It's, a, it's, it's someone who's under the discipline of another. It's a student. It's someone who's following a teacher. And you just can't teach people who don't want to learn. If there's people who don't have any interest in spiritual things, I mean, they're going to heaven, they got their, their ticket punched, you know, they got their fire escape, they're not going to go to hell, and that's good enough for them. I don't care what you do. You know, they're, they're not, if they don't want to learn, if they don't care about the things of God, all the follow-up in the world is not going to help. You'll never get them. So I'd rather just go knock another door and fill up his house. Amen. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and move on to verse 2 there. So verse... Verse 1 was quite a mouthful right there. So you can see how Matthew 5 might take a little time to get through here. I mean, when you're, when you're trying to expound the greatest sermon that's ever been preached, we might have to take a little time and slowly digest these things. It says in verse 2, And he opened his mouth and taught them. He taught disciples. People that wanted to learn something, right? What kind of person is it that's going to get to church and learn? What kind of person is that? The Bible says, I'll read to you from Psalms. It says, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore He will teach sinners in the way. The meek will He guide in judgment. The meek will He teach His way. He that feareth the Lord, him shall He teach. See, if you try to go out there and get people who are just too proud to come to church, they're too busy for God, they're likely to remain that way even after salvation. I and mean, you can go out and get somebody who's a know-it-all, who's just too proud or just too lazy, and when they get saved, now they're a saved, proud, lazy person. Now that's the only thing that's changed. And, and, and you, can't, you can't try and drag them out. They're just going to stay that way. And the Lord says the only person that's going to learn anything is the meek person. The only person that's going to learn anything is the person who actually fears God. That's the person that's going to be taught. <clears throat> Amen. You know, we can drag people, uh, you can drag all the people to church you want, but if they aren't meek, if they have no fear of God, they will learn nothing. And eventually they'll just go back, and I've seen it, Time and time again, where once they get what they want out of it, they're done. And they go back, and, and, you're, and then you're trying to drag them back out again. Let's go ahead and get into the verse 3 here. And of course, uh, you know, verse three, through, verse 3 through 11 are what's called the Beatitudes. You know, these are the blessed, where you know every verse starts with blessed, right? Very famous passage of Scripture. And the Bible says there in verse 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, of course, he's talking about the poor in spirit, meaning people who are spiritually poor. Poor in the sense of 
not being full of your own spirit. You know, Sunday morning we talked about the spirit, how people can have a bad spirit or a good spirit. You know, this is somebody who's not full of himself. This is somebody who's not puffed up. This isn't somebody who's, uh, you know, so, so high-minded that they can't uh, be taught anything. Somebody that is, has the humility to receive Christ. Because let's face it, to receive Christ, you have to have some degree of humility. I mean, that's why we see people who have... Um, it, that's why it's so hard in like wealthy neighborhoods to get people saved, yeah. because they're often very proud people, and they're also they're often very you know people who have worked very hard in their lives to earn a lot of money, yeah. and they've done everything themselves. Nobody's helped me out. That kind of an attitude, and to get saved, you have to get to the point and say, you know what? There's nothing that I do to go to heaven. It's a free gift. You just have to be humble enough to accept that. Amen. So that's why it's saying there, blessed are the poor in spirit, people who aren't so full of themselves that they can receive the Word of God with meekness. You know, <clears throat> that's good advice for the saved and unsaved. You know, it's good advice for the unsaved person to humble themselves and to, you know, get saved. I mean, that's pretty good advice, but it's also good advice for the saved as well. Go ahead and turn over to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. The Bible says in Isaiah 66, For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. So he's saying the guy that God's going to look upon, the man that he's going to look to, is the man who has a poor and contrite spirit. Now a contrite spirit would be somebody that has you know, a spirit of contrition or remorse or sorrow or, or sadness. <clears throat> I think John the Baptist is really a good example of someone who was poor in spirit. And he says there in John chapter 3, look at verse 26, and they came to John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. They're so saying, you know, you were the one baptizing at first, and now everyone's going to this guy, the guy that you baptized. And he's talking about Jesus Christ, of course. And John answered, verse 27, and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. I mean, that's a great, great attitude. I mean, John know that knew that for sure. He said, hey, the only reason I even did what I did is because God gave it to me. Amen. You know, He said, I'm, that's the only reason I got to baptize him at all is because it was given to me from heaven. He just felt privileged to be in that role. Verse 28, it says, Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I, that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. I mean, that's the spirit that we ought to have. That's the poor spirit that we ought to have. We say, you know what? Amen. Not about me, not my will, but thy will be done. You know, let ourselves increase. Not what I can get out of it. Not what is it for me, but what is it, what I can do for others. What, what, let me be decreased and let Christ in me be increased. Amen. See, John wasn't full of himself. And that's the kind of that's what it means to be poor in spirit. That is the kind of attitude that we should have, one that isn't full of himself. The Bible says, I'll read to you from Romans 12. For I say unto you, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. We ought not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Walk around and think, well, I'm really something. You know, I've really got this all figured out. Well, you only know something because it's been given unto you, you know that. You know, you received it because it was given to you. But to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. You see, people who are proud in spirit, they don't see their need for a Savior. And they don't receive the kingdom of heaven. But there's also th people who are saved, if we get too puffed up in our own minds, we think more highly than ourselves than we ought to. If we increase and He decreases, you know, we're, we're, we're not deceiving anybody but ourselves. You know, when we think ourselves to be something that we're not. <clears throat> Let's go and look at... Uh, Verse number four. Because the Bible says, you know, if a man thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. You know, everybody else can look around and say, that guy is a pompous, arrogant, puffed up jerk. But he doesn't think that. He's deceived himself, right? He's the only person that he's fooled. <clears throat> look at verse four. It says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, verses 4 through 6, if we kind of consider these, these are really attributes that we should be feeling, feeling inwardly before God. 
These are things that we would feel inside of ourselves, that we would do before God, that we would mourn, that we would be meek, that we would hunger and thirst after righteousness. These aren't necessarily things that we're going to express towards our fellow man. And when we do these things, it leads to his blessing. That's what we see here, right? They that mourn are comforted. That's a blessing. They that uh, hunger and thirst, or, or those that are meek, they, they inherit the earth. I mean, that's, that's a huge blessing, right? <clears throat> they that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. I mean, these are all blessings for things that we receive, that we receive for, doing, for feeling these things inwardly. Go ahead and turn over to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. It says there, they that mourn. Of course, that's the first one, right? And we won't spend a whole lot of time on these just to kind of move along, but it says in Ecclesiastes 7, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. He says, blessed are they that mourn. They would say, boy, that doesn't seem right. You know, we're living in a culture today where nobody wants to feel any sadness, where everyone wants to be happy, happy, happy all the time. They want the dopamine in their brain to just keep flowing. They'll start taking drugs all the time just to keep themselves happy. Nobody wants to go any, through any kind of discomfort, be it physical or emotional. We just want to be happy and entertained all the time. Just everything's great. But Jesus said, blessed are they that mourn. It's okay to be sad about things. I mean, there's times in our life when we should be sad. You know, if we lose a loved one or we're going through some hardship or some difficulty, there's nothing wrong with mourning. But, but people today will, will get so messed up in their thinking that they'll think even in, a, in a, you know, an extreme case such as that, like some tragedy befalls your life, that somehow you, know, you shouldn't be too sad about that for too long. That you're, you're going to develop chronic depression. And then you're going to have to, they'll put you on psychiatric drugs. <clears throat> but Jesus said, blessed are you if you mourn. And it says, it is better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting. It says, by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. It's better to have a sad heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of the mourning, it says. Look there in James chapter 4, look at verse 8. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hearts, ye sinners, and purify, or cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and enjoy the heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of God, and he shall lift you up. Sometimes we need to mourn about our you maybe there's some sin in our life that we should be sad about. That we should get right with God. I mean, mourning could be something that could bring us closer to God. He goes on and says there, blessed are the meek. <clears throat> Blessed are the meek. Go over, turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. No, there, there's a blessing in being meek. It says, For they shall inherit the earth. The Bible speaks very highly about being meek. But is that what we see in the world today? Is that what's lifted up? Is that what's praised? And that, is that what was promoted in our culture? To be a meek person? No, you, know, you look at the sports stars. I mean, look at the big you know, professional athletes. I mean, are there, are, are, by and large, they're not meek people. You know, they, they, I mean, the guy scores the touchdown, he's spiking the ball and doing the sprinkler and all. I can't do it. You know, the lawnmower. I don't know what they are. <laughs> they do all the moves, right? And they're just, they're, they're hot stuff, right? Everyone's just lifting them up and they just, they be like this guy. Be like me, kids, you know? These aren't, these aren't meek people. <clears throat> the Bible says in Psalms, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he will teach sinners in the way, in the way the meek will he guide in judgment. The meek will he teach his way. It says in Psalm 147, The Lord lifteth up the meek, and he casteth down the wicked to the ground. You want to be lifted up. You know, I'd rather not be lifted up by the world. I'd rather be lifted up by the Lord. Amen. I'd rather have God lift me up than the world praise me. And if that's going to happen, it says the Lord lifteth up the meek. We could think about a great man. You know, I believe we should have people that we look to, up to in the faith. We should have people that are our heroes in the faith. And I think Moses is a great one. I mean, if you want to talk about one of my favorite Old Testament characters, I mean, I think Moses is probably my favorite. I, I just some about him. Just reading, you know, just because of the stories that are he's involved in. I mean, you could really put yourself in Moses' shoes sometimes and think about the things he saw when he went up into the mountain. He saw the fire and he heard the trumpets and the smoke and the blackness. And I mean, just it's, you know, it's it just gives you shivers to think about the things that and, and Moses saying and the people saying, you know, I, I do. Uh, I, you know, they, they feared and they quaked before God. And the ground shaking beneath their feet. All these things that they, they saw and heard. I mean, Moses lived I mean, an exciting life. But the Bible says that Moses was very meek above all men that were upon the face of the earth. And what happened with Moses? He was called the friend of God. God spoke to him face to face as a man doth his friend. Because he, he was meek enough. He was meek enough that he drew nigh to God 
and God drew nigh to him. I mean, that's exciting to think about. But we won't get that if we're proud people. You're there in 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 4. 1 Peter 3, 4. It says, let it be the hidden man of the heart. You know, this is, of course, is talking about a woman's adorning. You know, this is, a, this is an attribute that women should seek to have. Meekness. It says, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Having a meek and quiet spirit for a woman is very becoming. It says it's like an ornament. You know, ladies, they, of course, they're, they're often concerned with their appearance and making them, you know, they want to put in the ornament to make themselves look nice. When on the sight, it says here in the sight of God that it's of great price. That when you put on a meek and quiet spirit, that God looks at you and you're very beautiful in the eyes of God. So we can see the blessing that comes when you're a meek person. He goes on there in Matthew chapter 4 and he says, Blessed are they, verse 6, Matthew six, Matthew uh, 5, verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. The Bible says in Psalm 22, The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek Him. Your heart shall live forever. And of course, this is talking about you know hungering and thirsting, not physically, but spiritually. I mean, we often, how often when we go very long without food? What's the longest we're willing to go or have ever gone? You know, it's not very long for some of us. We're thinking, man, it's been a whole three hours. <laughs> you know, where's the nearest drive-through? You know, <clears throat> but he's saying here, you're more blessed to hunger after after righteousness. Do we feel that way about our Bible reading? Do we feel that way about our prayer life? Do we feel that way about memorizing scripture? Do we feel that way about you know going to church or or soul winning or any spiritual things? Things that are, would be you know after righteousness. Do we hunger for those things the same way we would hunger for physical things? Now, there in Matthew chapter 5, it goes on and says in, Matthew, in verse 7, and it starts to ex express here, in verses 7 through 9 are more, these are more of the attributes that we should express outwardly. So we saw first the ones that we should got to express inwardly, things we should feel inwardly. Now we're going to look at some things that maybe we should express outwardly that, that other people should, should see. It says there in verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, if you would, again, keep something there. But turn to 2 Samuel 22. 2 Samuel 22. And I think this is a very important concept that we understand in Scripture. And the reason it's important is because of the fact that we're all sinners. You know, we're all, we're all capable of, 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 of uh, committing sin and getting backslidden. And it might be one day that we need to obtain some mercy. You know, maybe, maybe more than, than usual. You know, I'm sure if we're praying, there's things that we're, the Holy Ghost is bringing in our mind that we're having to confess, or when we mess up during the day, saying or thinking or doing something that, you know, we're very quick to confess that before God and to try and get that right. But there might be a come a time when we're in need of some real mercy. I pray it never happens, but it could be. And it says there, if you look in um, 2 Samuel 22, look at verse 1. And David spake unto the, Lord, uh, unto the Lord the words of this song on the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all of his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. He said, With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. So you can see why Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And David said something very similar here, didn't he? He said, Thou wilt show thyself merciful with those that are merciful. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. So if we want mercy from God, we need to be willing to show mercy to others. You know, David didn't avenge himself on God or on, on Saul, did he? I mean, Saul was pursuing him, trying to kill him. God, David was the rightful uh, king of Israel. That was his throne that Saul was sitting in. If he was right and had a, a good attitude, Saul, if he was going to do the right thing, would have stepped aside and let David take the throne. But instead he's pursuing David, trying to kill David. And David, in more than one instance, had an opportunity to take Saul's life. But what did he say? I will not touch the Lord's anointed. That he wouldn't even stretch out. He, I mean, he cuts the skirt off his garment and it smotes his heart. And that's the, how merciful and how tender-hearted David was. And as a result, I believe that's why God showed David great mercy later when he committed his sin with Bathsheba. When he committed adultery and murder. I mean, wicked sins. And God says, thou shalt not die. Right? I think a part of that was because of the fact that David understood something, that in order to receive mercy, we have to be merciful people. It says there in Matthew chapter, uh, go back to Matthew chapter 7. And again, I mean, every single one of these points that we could just stop and preach whole sermons on. 
These are such powerful, deep truths that we need to really let sink down into our ears and our hearts. The Bible says in uh, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. <clears throat> now, if we were, I had you move already, so I won't have you flip back, but if you were to keep reading in 2 Samuel, it goes on and says in verse 27, With the pure thou wilt show thyself pure, and with the forward thou wilt show thyself unsavory. So just like if you want to be, have merci be merciful, if you want that, you have to, you have to show mercy. But if you want to be pure, you have to. If you want, if you want God to be pure towards you, you know what does that mean? If you want God to be true to you, if you want God to be sincere, I believe that's what it's talking about here when it's talking about pureness. It's talking about sincerity. You know you, that that person is a sincere person. He's pure. His motives are right. But he's, t you know, you, you can trust that person. Go ahead and turn over to First Timothy one. First Timothy one. I believe that's what it's talking about. It says that when you know you have to be pure. He's saying there, blessed are the pure in heart. It says there in 1 Timothy 1, look at verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. What kind of a heart? A pure heart. And of a good conscience and of a faith unfeigned. Not a fake faith. Not being fake. Being sincere, being pure, having a pure heart. One that's not double-hearted. You know, it's the same thing all the way through. It's pure. What you see is what you get. That kind of a person. That's the kind of heart that we want to have. That's the kind of person we want to be. Took it over to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll see where pureness and being unfeigned or being sincere is related. You're going over to 1 Peter chapter 1. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, Flee also youthful lust, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You know, people with a pure heart that want to follow righteousness, that want to follow faith, they want to follow charity and peace. They have the right motives. They're sincere. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Seeing have you purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned faith of the brethren. You've purified your souls. There's purity involved here in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently. <clears throat> Look at verse 9, Matthew. Uh, we're going to go, we'll read verse 9 here. It says there, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Matthew 5, verse 9. You know, Jimmy Carter's life verse, apparently. <laughs> Matthew chapter 9. I don't know why I remember that. I think my mom told me that. So I don't know. It says in verse 9 that blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Children of God. So who are the peacemakers? Well, I think that's referring to somebody who's a soul winner. Because we go out and we make peace between the sinner and God. Don't we? Isn't that what we do? When we go out, I mean, before a person gets saved, the Bible says that they are at enmity with God. Now, what's interesting here is that only we need to understand that only a child of God, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now, only a child of God can make peace between a sinner and God. And we're going to see that. Go ahead and turn over to James chapter 3. Only a, only a child of God can make peace between a sinner and God. It can be a peacemaker in that sense. Because only a child of God can beget a child of God. See, when we go out and we get somebody saved, when we get somebody born again, when we preach them the gospel and they get saved, and now that enmity has been removed, and now that they are at peace with God, and now they also have become God's child, that's something that's only done by a child of God. That's something that only a child of God can do. Look at James 3, verse 18. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So, it's saying here, that the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So when we go out and make peace between the sinner and God, that's the fruit of righteousness, right? Now what does Proverbs 11 say? It says the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. And it says that he that winneth souls is wise. So the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. So the sinner or the or the soul winner, you know, we are that tree of life. And our fruit is what? What is the fruit, the fruit of the righteous? It's another tree of life, right? 
Just like an apple tree, you know, it's going to produce another apple tree. Right? So when we go out and we make peace, when we go out and we preach the gospel, and we, we make another child of God, we are sowing fruit. That is our fruit, is another tree of life. Amen. So we can see how this verse can kind of be applied there, where, it's, where it says, the peacemaker shall be called the children of God. Because it's the peacemaker, the child of God, who goes out and sows the fruit of righteousness and makes another tree of life. Hopefully that made sense to you. I don't know. But let's go ahead and look at Luke 14. Luke 14. <laughs> Who else is somebody else that makes peace? Well, we would think of an ambassador, right? If two countries were kind of going at it with each other, they go out and they're, uh, you know, they're they're get, they're they're on the on the brink of war. You know, there's a lot of negotiating going on to try and avoid that. And often it's the diplomats, the ambassadors that are speaking to one another. They're trying to communicate between the parties involved to try to work a peace agreement out. The Bible says in Luke 14, verse 31, says, Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So what does he send? He sends an ambassage, right? Which is a which is based that word is a variant of ambassage, right? Or ambassage, excuse me, ambassage and ambassage. An ambassage is the message or commission entrusted to an ambassador. So this king has got other people coming against him. He's saying, "I can't win this war." He desires conditions of peace. He sends out his ambassador, you know, the am, am, and the ambassage with his message of peace. So that's how we can see it again that in a, in a way that we are the peacemakers shall be called the children of God because we've also been given a great you know commission a great uh, uh, message of peace that we're to go out and preach that why that's why it says in 2 Corinthians that we are ambassadors for Christ Amen. that we are to carry that message of peace to a lost and dying world to those that are at enmity with God as though God did beseech them by us and and to pray them to be reconciled to God. So that's how the peacemakers can be called the children of God because the children of God are those that go out and make peace. Amen. Let's look at uh, verses 10 through 12. And this is kind of something I really wanted to get to tonight. And I'll try to close on this point because this is I think this is really important. <clears throat> Especially in the day and age that we live in. And uh, you know maybe I rushed a little bit too much on, on the rest of that stuff to get to this, but I really wanted to get to this because I think this is important. It says there in verses 10 through 12, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now one of the first things we need to understand about these verses that are all dealing with persecution is that persecution is the result of righteousness or righteous living. It says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. You know, going out and, and being persecuted because you're a loudmouth jerk is not righteousness sake, right? Going out and just causing trouble and then saying, oh, I'm being persecuted. That's not persecution. That's just, that's just sowing and, and reaping. Yeah. He's saying very specifically that you have to be, it's blessed are those which are persecuted for righteousness sake, right? For godly living. Some persecution, so-called, I believe, is self-inflicted. Some people go out of their way and are just they 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 are they don't have understanding, they're not mature, whatever it is. And what they would call persecution is really just the way the world works. You know, you can't go out and be a jerk and not expect people to have some blowback, right? Right. <clears throat> Notice there it says the blessed persecution is that which comes for my sake, for the sake of Jesus Christ. The other thing I want us to notice in this passage is that persecution is guaranteed if you're going to be living righteous. If you're going to be doing it for Jesus and for His sake, for righteousness sake, you can mark it down that you are going to be persecuted. It says there, men shall revile you. <laughs> Blessed are you when men shall revile you. Not if, not when, not maybe, shall. So here's the thing, we need to not let it catch us off guard. We need to be on we need to watch and pray and understand that this is something that's going to happen if we're going to live for God. 
The Bible says in 1 Peter 4, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. We shouldn't catch us off guard. We shouldn't think it's strange when persecution comes. If you're part of a church that's going to stand in the Word of God in this wicked and evil and adulterous world that we're living in, in these United States which are being just given over to all the vilest and most wicked sins, I mean, this country is just, just becoming more and more anti-Christ every That's single right. day. Right. So not, let's not think it's strange when the Bible gets preached and the, the enemies of God rally the wagon, you know, circle the wagons, and we start to feel some persecution. Yeah. It's going to happen. Yeah. <clears throat> Go ahead and turn over to 2 Timothy, verse 3. 2 Timothy, chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 10. It says, in verse 10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience. Oh, how we would love it for just to be a period right there. Right? We love that first verse. We love how Paul was just a man of purpose and faith and long-suffering and charity and patience. We love those things. And those things that we should look for in our, in our pastors but he always also goes on and says, verse 11, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium at Lystra, which came unto him because he was a man of God preaching the word and the world around him didn't like the things he had to say. And Paul's saying, look, you know this about me, Timothy. You know what things I've endured. There it says there, uh, what, what persecutions I endured, but out of, the Lord, out of them all the Lord deliver me. And he goes on and says this in verse 12. Yea, and all, all, everybody that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if you're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, that's, that's kind of the, the clause there. That if you're going to live godly. Because as we talked about earlier, every person who gets saved isn't going to be a disciple. Every person who is, is going on their way to heaven isn't going to live godly for Christ Jesus. And oftentimes it's the persecution that makes them back out because they think it's strange because they don't understand that's part of the Christian life. If you're living a godly Christian life in Christ Jesus, you shall suffer persecution. I mean, go ask some of the pastors in this movement that we associate with if persecution is real. You know, go ask Pastor Anderson, our pastor, if he's ever suffered some persecution for, for righteousness' sake. Go ask Pastor you know, Roger Jimenez over at Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento, California, if he's ever suffered persecution for righteousness' sake. I walk through that picket line. I've been at both protests. I've been at the one at Faithful Word, and I've been at one at Very. And I tell you what, the one at Very was way more intense. Way more intense. I mean, it was hundreds of these people. And I'll tell you what, something else. It was also probably one of the most exciting services I've ever been in. One of the most memorable services I've ever been in. Go ask Pastor David Burzens right now in Atlanta, Georgia at Stronghold Baptist Church, if, if, if suffering persecution for righteousness' sake is a real thing that can be expected here in 2019 America. And they'll all tell you yes, because they've all gone through it. And what I really like about, especially I was listening to Pastor Burson's just this, this last week, and he was kind of talking about everything that's happened to him. And you know what he called it? He called it a light affliction. I thought, man, what a great attitude. What a great attitude to have. And he said, you know what, I haven't resisted them in the blood. He's saying I, that what I'm having to go through is light. I mean, when you compare it to the things that people have gone through in the Bible, being sawn asunder, you know, tormented, being, you know, having to live in caves and sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, afflicted. I mean, oh no, they're going to write a news article about me. You know, or they're going to go on my Facebook page and give me one star and tell me I'm mean. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's light, it really is a light affliction. I'm sure it's not easy for the men that are going through it or their families sometimes when you, when you have these sodomites and everybody that's just you know, attacking you, getting, making you lose your job. You know, I'm not saying it's, the, it's a cakewalk, but in comparison, it's not that bad. I mean, to what it, you know, that's the theme of 2019, right? It could be worse. That's like, that's like the theme right now. It could be worse. I don't want to make light of the fact that of what they've, what even those men have gone through, but I want us to all understand one thing: that when it comes to persecution, and if you ever have to go through it in your own personal life, welcome to the club. Welcome to being a Christian. 
Welcome to living godly for Christ Jesus. It's, yeah, the, it's part of the package. Yeah. And what happens a lot of times, and it's why it's so important to understand that it's going to happen, is because people fall away in persecution. And perse Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 13. Persecution has a way of weeding out shallow Christians. That's what I've noticed. Because a lot of times, you know, the, the soft Christians, you know, the ones that are just made out of wax, you know, they're not, they're not carved out of wood, they're not forged out of steel. When it gets hot, they just melt like a candle. And they get all soft and mushy and <clears throat> they're good for nothing. But it says there in Matthew chapter 13, look at verse 20. But he that receives seed into the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. And he's glad to hear the word. He's glad to be saved. He's glad to be a Christian. He's glad he's on his way to heaven. And amen. Yet he hath not rooted himself, but doeth for a little while. For when tribulation or persecution cometh because of the word, by and by it is offended. I mean, eventually some they're gonna, the family's going to say, why are you in skirts all the time? Why do you keep having kids? You know, why do you got to go to church three times a week? Why do you, what do you mean you don't drink anymore? You name it. Just start going down the list. And you know, maybe, maybe it's those things that won't get you, but by and by, if you don't have root in yourself, if, you, if these things catch you off guard, you're going to be offended. We can also learn that, you know, persecution is often verbal and not always physical. I mean, we haven't even begun to go through physical persecution. When I walked through that picket line in Verity, I thought I'm up, maybe I'd get a water bottle off my head at least or something. I could say I physically suffered for Christ. But I didn't even get that. You know, I was hoping maybe one of those signs would get thrown at me or something. <laughs> I did have a guy spit at me once, but it wasn't for Christ. <laughs> That's another story. We can talk about that later. But persecution is often verbal and not always physical. It says men shall revile you, right? They shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. So it's the thing, that's how that's where it starts with their words. I mean, go look at Stronghold Baptist Church's Facebook page. And I'm glad that these filthy sodomites are going on that page and just showing everybody that's exactly what they are. You go read those comments, and if you're a kid, I, I highly recommend you don't. Or if you have, you know, you're a little sensitive to foul language, don't do it. Yeah. But there's sodomites on there that are saying some of those disgusting things that you could ever imagine. And that's just, that's just things that they're saying publicly. I mean, I, I bet if, you, you know, I've, I've, I, being the deacon, I listen to Faithful Words voicemails. Let me tell you something, there's some charmers out there. There's some guys out there that have some choice words for Pastor Anderson. Why? Because he's standing up for, and he's being persecuted for the Lord's sake. And it's just right. words. That's where it starts. So if we can't handle verbal persecution, I mean, you can imagine if Pastor Anderson went in and listened to his voicemails and was just like, oh, no, I can't do it anymore, I'm done. And just quit. I mean, that would be weak. That would be soft. Right. If we can't handle verbal being called names, we're never going to make it through the physical persecution. We'll never make it. We don't have a chance. The Bible says in Jeremiah 12, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, how shalt thou contend with the horses? You know, you're worried about the homo on your Facebook page or the family relative getting offended at your standard of living or something like that and calling you a name, you weirdo, you cult member. Just throwing out some, some thing, trying to make fun of you. What are you going to do when the, you know, the UN shows up with their white helmets and tanks and they're ready to you know, yeah. pull you asunder and, and burn you at the stake? Right. You're going to fold quick. Physical persecution will come to some people. Look at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Jesus tells us, you know, for the sake of time, I'll have you just go to Matthew 24. We're all familiar with these verses. I assume in Matthew chapter 24 it says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, that this time nor ever shall be. Jesus said that there was going to come a time on this earth that there was the great tribulation to, that, from, that was not since the beginning of the world. The world hasn't even seen the greatest amount of tribulation that's come. And there's been some tribulation in this world. Has there not, has there not been bloody, horrific wars where millions have died? I mean, even, even the Jews, have they not suffered at, at the hand of God physically when the Romans are tearing down their cities? And even, even in the Old Testament where the Babylonians, the Assyrians are carrying them away and slaughtering people. But Jesus said that compared to what's coming is can't even compare to that. You can't even, you can't even compare the two. It's persecution 
that cannot be, that, that was not since the beginning of this world to this time. And he goes and says, nor ever shall be. That is yet to happen. And it very well may be in our lifetime. Or it may be very well in our children's lifetimes. Or our grandchildren's lifetimes. And if it's not in ours, and maybe we as the adults should at least set the example by, you know, being able to deal with a little verbal persecution. Amen. By being able to at least, if we can't endure, you know, the aunt or the uncle or the cousin or the, the random, you know, stranger on Facebook or whoever that's going to, you know, verbally assault us or persecute us, and our kids are watching us, and we're just, we are, you know, get all up and our, 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 our feathers just get ruffled over that, can we really expect our children to endure that great tribulation that might come upon them? If that's the example we're going to set. <clears throat> now, persecution, verbal or physical, you know, it, either one is not a light matter. It's not something that we should take lightly because we've seen even, even by and by, people get offended for the word's sake. Just the word, you know. <clears throat> I don't want to make light of that, but it still, it still, still does stand to reason if you can't endure one, you can't endure the other. <clears throat> But I also want us to understand that there is great reward in heaven for those that are able to endure persecution or those that suffer persecution. The Bible says in Revelation 7, these are they which came out of great tribulation. So he's talking about those that went through that great tribulation that is yet to come. And they came out. They came through. They were killed. They lost their lives. It says, they are, these are they which came out of great tribulation have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He, sit, he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. And they shall hunger, hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light upon them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I mean, that is a reward in heaven. Amen. Think about that. <clears throat> of a person who endures persecution to that extreme is going to be rewarded where they're going to dwell with God in His throne. And then it's going to be God that leads them and feeds them and keeps them warm and gives them light. <clears throat> so how should we handle persecution in light of the great reward that, you know, that we can receive? And there are rewards in heaven for those that, are, that, endure, that endure persecution. So we should ask ourselves, well, I want to get those rewards. You know? Well, how are you going to handle persecution then? Handle it with meekness, right? In the spirit of Christ. It's interesting that it was the poor in spirit and those that are persecuted that both received the kingdom of heaven. Do we notice that? That's the only one that repeats itself. Those that are poor in spirit, they receive the kingdom of heaven. And they that are persecuted for righteous name, they receive the kingdom of heaven. Because I think in order for you to endure that persecution, you have to be poor in spirit. You have to be meek. You have to have the spirit of Christ. He has to be increased in you and you have to be decreased. The Bible says in Matthew 10, the disciple is not above his master nor a servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple to be as his master and the servant as, as his Lord. But if they have called the master of the house be else above, how much more shall they call them of his household? He said, Fear them not which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell. Jesus said, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. He said, The world cannot hate you. But me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. If they hated Jesus Christ and His words, they're going to hate us when we preach His words. The Bible says in 1 Peter that we are called because Christ has also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in His footsteps. Follow in His steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in His mouth. You know, when you're persecuted for just living godly in Christ Jesus, it's not your fault. It's not because you did something wrong. It's because they hate righteousness. It's because they hate what you stand for. He, Jesus did no sin. Neither guile was found in his mouth. But what? how did he handle it? I mean, when we know we're right, when we know we haven't done anything wrong, and persecution comes on us, what's our natural reaction? It's to lash out, to fight back, to defend ourselves. That's natural. But that's not what Jesus did. And that's... The kind, we have to have the Spirit of Christ if we're going to endure and suffer persecution, if we're going to make it. The Bible says, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but he committeth himself to him that judges right, righteously. 
So we have to have that spirit. Let's say, you know what? I'm not being caught off guard and understanding that persecution is going to come. And that when it comes, that we're not going, we're not going to lash out. We're not going to get offended. We're not going to lose our cool. We're just going to endure and know that it'll pass. You know, the homos aren't outside Verity Baptist Church anymore, at least that I know of. And they're certainly not out faithful word, and I don't think they'll ever be back because they saw how it went for them last time. The doors are still open every every church service. The church continues to grow. And we just committed ourselves to him that, that, that the judges right, righteously. And I want to just touch real quick because I want to start in verse 17 next week. So I really want to just very quickly, and I, I know we've been here a little long tonight, but if we could look at verses 13 through 15, because I believe 13 and 15 are tied in with, uh, with these previous verses. Verses 11 and 12 are kind of tied in with uh, 13 or 15. It says in verse 13, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith it shall be salted. It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So Jesus at the end here, he's encouraging these people to, he's saying, look, you're the salt of the earth and if, and if, if you lose your, your flavor, your savor, wherewith shall you be salted? He's saying, you know, you are the light of the world and if your light goes out, you know, how are we going to see? Exactly. You, if you're going to shine, if you're going to live for Christ, a city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. He says, if you don't, put a, you don't light a candle and put it on a bushel stick, that'd be pointless. It's useless at that point. And he says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's no coincidence that right after he warns these people about persecution, he then encourages them to say, look, stay salty. Keep the light on. You know, shine in the light of all this. That, you know, don't let these people quench your spirit. Don't let these people put your light out through persecution. Amen. And it's an important because a city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. And we are the light of the world. We are to shine the world. We are to let other men see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. And if we let persecution take us out, turn the light off, then our gospel is going to be hid, isn't it? It's going to be that light that's put under a bushel. But it's going to be hid not to us. It's going to be hid to them that are lost. So that's why we should endure all things for the, for, for the elect's sake. That's why we should be willing to take persecution and not revile again and be that good testimony. Because it's for others, it's for the lost, it's for those that are watching. So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer.